and welcome. Uh, we're going to talk about value stream mapping uh, for the next couple of hours. Uh, today, we're going to take a look at some of the traditional process mapping techniques that are out there. We're going to look at a new, potentially new process mapping technique called value stream mapping. We'll get into the details of that. We're going to do some activities uh, in the group related to that, and hopefully we're going to learn a lot. So welcome, enjoy, and let's get started. So what we're going to cover here is the basics of value stream mapping. So with each one of the model cells, that we've been doing here at IPRO. Mm -hmm. One of the initial things that we work on is uh, the first few days is called Kaizen Week. And during that week, we begin modeling uh, the new process. So we go through some Lean 101 training. We talk about the difference between waste and value added work. And we utilize the value stream mapping tool to visually represent how the process is working today in a current state map perspective and then a future state map perspective uh, about how what we're going to try and achieve and what we're going to solve for as we try to improve the process. So it's a critical tool that we utilize in the, in the transformation process. Uh, the transformation process could be as little as 90 days or maybe as long as 120. We try to generally take small pieces of improvement over 90 days and try to make a big impact in the organization. We reference the value stream mapping tool over and over again in that process. And uh, we teach the team how to utilize it. So the goal here today is to share that with you so you have some experience around what these value stream maps are, how they work, and how you can utilize them uh, and interact with the teams that are creating and using them. One of the premises that I have for getting together as a group to talk about value stream mapping is if, if it is one of the main tools that we utilize for the transformation, the management team needs to know how to ask good questions about it when they're interacting with the team members in order to create uh, an effective set of questions and coaching and support for what the teams are doing from a change and transformation perspective. If you can't do that, then it's a mystery, right? So we want to have everyone have just a, enough layer of skill to be able to do that type of work as well. Uh, to be able to read, interpret, and sort of and do all those things. So is there a process that we could use as an example today that's common to all the groups that we could uh, use as an example as we kind of talk through this today? And I was thinking about this last night and I was thinking, you all must travel once in a while? Yes? Most people? Yeah. And when you do, you probably have uh, a travel process that you have to go through. Yes. You know, I don't know, yes. a series of steps. So let's experiment with that one a little bit today, if that's okay. So, <clears throat> and so the first step that I would like to take on in order to do that is, um, if you were to map the process today, you probably have an idea in your head uh, about what those steps are. And kind of how they flow, and uh, we're not uh, we're not doing any exact or precise work here today. But in order to uh, get a better understanding of that, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to go behind you and, and draw that on the pieces of paper that are on the wall right behind you, if you would. Uh, just go up and nothing formal here, just high level draft. Each, each, take a, each our own unique interpretation. Each of your the, own uh, unique interpretation process. of it, if you would, just very quickly. So I you have one more task so that you have to do before you're done. You have to write down on there um, how long it usually takes to get from one end to the other of your process. Just generally, what do you think? Make that number on there, please. And days, hours, minutes, weeks, months, I don't know what the how long it generally takes to do that. Not for each step, just for the overall. Just for the overall. Okay. So I'm going to use your examples here. Naomi, could you tell us very quickly what you crafted out here? Well, whoever needs to travel, we put in a travel request and travel log, and the supervisor has to pull this uh, on, mm -hmm. online on travel log, and then Dawn's area uh, usually is, is Kathy. Uh, she would uh, 
once it's approved, the, the email will be showing out to them, and she would book uh, airfare, hotel, whatever the request to ask for, mm -hmm. and also the front desk would, would book the say the airport, the car service for people. Um, after that, people travel and. Um, when they come back, they submit their travel voucher to the accounting finance department, and obviously that voucher needs to be approved by the director or mm -hmm. the person's you know title is. Um, after that, accounting will process the payment. You know, it could be all this traveler could be out of area traveler, uh, could be local travel to hospital for review. Um, it could be people like you traveling to San Francisco mm -hmm. and local travel would be using the local travel voucher or out of area travel. So it matters if it's yes. local or not local, that changes a little bit? Yes, mm -hmm. local travel would not involve mm -hmm. airfare, hotel, um, right. out of area so would one involve day, a lot of One day to two weeks potentially. It could be one day if a rush travel, right? Yeah. I mean, somebody could, I mean. Mm -hmm. Or it could be much longer. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Wendy, could you tell us what you have here? This is where and when we're traveling. Then we do some research on the flights, trains, the routes, the hotels. Do they have the government rate? Then we entered into travel log. Then we get approvals. Then we usually have to do some, the booking. Then we have to check the booking for any errors. Then we often have to renegotiate and rebook alternatives because there's no vacancy, there's better rates, there's some mistake on the flight. Mm -hmm. um, then at the travel location, we have to collect all our receipts and everything during the travel. But we also have to check was the Amex details sent to the hotel, um, otherwise you're putting out your own credit card and then contacting the office and back and forth. And then we have to, when we get back, we fill out the travel voucher then we get approvals, and then we submit. Okay, so when I look visually at what I have here in the room, I see three different visual representations of the process. I see some similar steps, some not similar steps. Some of them might be unique to your department or not. We recognize that not all the processes are the same for everyone. But when we're trying to, if we were working to try and improve the process here, we would want to create some level of standard that we could measure against about how the process works and how long it takes and everything else. And can I do that from our existing documentation here today? I'd say it'd be very hard. Oftentimes we see this, this is not just with the travel process, but we see this with a lot of the business processes in organizations as well. So it might be an old process map somewhere it might be uh, that's not up to date or could be up to date, but nobody looks at it. Uh, and if we're training somebody, somebody sits with somebody that did it before and they go through the process and they make some notes. And it becomes, in some ways, it's kind of a highly variable process. So let me show you some information about uh, value stream mapping and how a value stream map might work and uh, how it's being used inside your organization to solve for some of these issues that we have. Value stream map. Simple tool, visually represents what's going on in a value stream. So I keep using this word value and stream. And one of the reasons that we use value stream is because we're trying to separate value from waste in the process when we look at it. And this tool helps us do that. So it helps us remove wasteful steps and redundant steps out of the process, extra handoffs, but we have to identify what value is before we start it. So if we took your um, travel um, process, what are the value, value components that come out of it that we would want to protect when we're redesigning the process? The right price for the government rates. Follows the government rates, right? So you can't stay at the wrong place, uh, or you probably don't get reimbursed for all of it, or maybe you're not, maybe you're not allowed to stay there. Keep going. There are probably other couple pieces of value in here. I mean, the, the fact that it gets approved at all, right? They're trying to get the, the travel approved, so that's a piece of value. 
I got the travel, it was approved. It was approved on the timeline that I wanted it approved on. It was at the right place. Uh, and afterwards, I was reimbursed effectively. Those are probably some of the highest value components of this process. Do you care in this process how many times you fill out your receipt forms or how many times you try to book a hotel? Do you say, I wish I could try to book five times because that would be more valuable? Yeah. No, obviously not, right? That's waste. Yeah. So when we think about a value stream, we're trying to separate the wasteful components, but we're trying to protect the value add components as well. Sometimes in process design, I've seen people work in process design and they end up cutting both by trying to streamline the process. And then it doesn't work, and then it's a bad process and people say, yep, yeah, it's just the accountant's trying to save money again, but it doesn't work, so we have to do what we have to do anyway at the end of the day. So this, this process of value stream mapping, in the beginning, we actually document what the value added components of this process were. The other thing that we do at the start of it is, uh, when I asked you all to map your travel process, you all started kind of at the same place, but not always. One starts with a travel request, another one starts with a determine the time and need, and some of you ended up getting your receipts paid, and some of you ended up getting, uh, getting a return and filling out the receipts. So one of the things that we do as part of the value stream mapping process as well is we establish the starting and ending point. So we have a defined scope for mapping this process early on, and we have a defined value for it, and we have a defined customer. We believe that without those three things in place to begin with, an agreement amongst the group and or the sponsor of the process that we're going to improve, that we have a, we have a low chance of success without those things. So we want to be sure to have them agreed upon in the beginning. So there is a process for doing this as well as uh, using the tool itself. So when we took on different parts of your process, when your team members started to improve different parts of the process, we looked very closely at those things first so we could be the most expeditious as possible in the transformation process and we wouldn't have to back up over and over again and talk about what's included, what's not included. Uh, and the idea for that is that we want to create a focus that we can make change in in a short period of time um, to prove good results and get momentum to continue to do good work in that way. So value stream level versus process level, same different uh, as I've been talking about. Uh, same principles, different uh, altitude different attitude, different, all kinds of different things in this process. So when we look at, your value stream could be a very high level within the organization. It could also be a very small level. There could be value, there could be, this sales could be a value stream, accounting could be a value stream, IT could be a value stream. As a matter of fact, we're working with a West Close client right now, it's a very big one in their IT area, and they've identified something like 150 value streams. We're working on four of them with them right now. So it's kind of like those Russian nesting dolls. You know, it depends on how local to the process it is, but the idea is that we take on something that's horizontal uh, across different departments. And you did a nice job of that here. You started in your own area, then you talked about uh, I need to send it to my supervisor, that's another player in it, then it needs to go into some technical system I think I heard over here. So there's a technology component aligned in there, and then it needs to go out to some other system. you, you got a lot of different people involved in order to get that value at the end. And we want to do that with each one of the value stream processes that we do here, but we're going to kind of do it from beginning to end. And uh, we're going to make sure that we have participation from all the people that are involved in it, which is one of the keys as well. I don't know enough about your processes in order to build a, a, a proper value stream map. We facilitated the work that was being done to keep people on track with a standard, but they did the work, and that's the key, is we have to have a participation across all the different areas of the value stream, and then we have to have a collaborative work group that defines how this could be. In most cases, 
they start out in the beginning and say, there's no way we can make a standard that works across all groups. And at the end, they say, I guess this standard will work across all groups. But we will also always be open if there needs to be any variation, and we will note that as it relates to unique circumstances. Most of the time, we don't find that there are that many unique circumstances. So that's really interesting line up. But we don't impose that thinking in the beginning. We let them come to that conclusion as they define the process for the organization. So the participation often says is, uh, you know, if we're working in a particular department and a customer like uh, CMS is often your customer here, do we want to include CMS? That was some of the discussion that we had in different processes that we're talking about. For instance, the D generation of the D1 report, which is a summary report for CMS. And uh, after discussion with the leadership and the team members, they felt that they had enough to improve without the inclusion of DMS, uh, CMS to begin with, that maybe we should do that first. And I said, good, that's good. I think it's the right thing to do, but we should have a vision open to when we should include them. And if they would have said, let's include CMS to begin with, I would have advised against it. Because there's enough for us to clean up first before we start including other people. Yeah, but I was just again thinking that would be quite a challenge to bring patients in because, of course, I mean, anyone sitting in an emergency department, you hear the wrong things, and everyone has an opinion in the emergency department or patients about what should be happening. So it would be fascinating and you know, beneficial to get the opinion, but how do you do that? Like, right? so that's the first step without. Are you talking about the customer or the people in the well, department? Everybody involved. Yeah, and that's, that's the hard work of doing value stream mapping, right. is the facilitation and the collaboration of the people. Right. And uh, one of the things that we emphasize as well is this is we don't have managers define how the process works. Right. We have the people that do the work every day define how the process works. But we need managers in there because they have the knowledge of how things connect to other value streams. They, they're and they're going to have to approve how the process works and help support it long term. So we need the voice of them, but we create the inclusion of all the team members and all their opinions. And a lot of times when people come to us, they say, um, we don't want to include Jim in this because Jim is really angry and he doesn't play well with others. And when we start the mapping process, we say we want all the Jims we can get our hands on to be included. We want the people that are kind of the naysayers in the process because at the end of the day, every single time we've been through this, those, those people become the loudest voice on the improvement factor because they can see we're actually going to do something, it's going to be beneficial, and they become missionaries to help support us moving forward. We want the grumpiest people. We I love them. I imagine, too, with this including customer, it probably depends on, I don't know much about emergency department patient flow or anything like that, but I imagine like they're kind of carried along the journey, whereas with CMS, they're probably participatory in the process, right? You have to give something to see if they're gonna do something, give it back to you, that affects the timeline. It affects the patients the could be participatory potentially, but they can also be knocked out. Right. <laughs> you don't know. Yeah. But CMS is a, is an active customer. Right. And one of the interesting things about the administrative and office work that we do from a process flow perspective is often our customer is also our supplier. So CMS is the one requesting the work, and they're the one receiving the work. But they're also the one re setting the requirements and dictating how the work is being done. So uh, in the manufacturing world, so a lot of this started in the manufacturing. I don't work in manufacturing for the most part. But in manufacturing, you have a supplier that sends you nuts and bolts and those get assembled into something and then you make a blender and you sell that to a customer. The customer has no interest or involvement in supplying the nuts and bolts. In our world, the world you live in, the world I live in most of the time, the supplier and the customer are the same people. So people say, well, we really can't control CMS. Actually, we can. Uh, it depends on how we interact with them and how well we inform them of what we're doing and how the struggles are. Um, we have... Um, these maps 
up here on the wall, and I know I asked you to do this in just a few minutes. You would do a much better job if I asked you to come back to me in a month and give me a good map. But the fact is, is it's very hard for us when everyone's thinking independently about how to draw a map to collaborate together to actually improve the process. So if we put a standard out there to allow people to collaborate in a standardized way, we can get success and results much easier and quicker. The other hard thing about this is I asked you how long it takes, and I see days, weeks, months uh, as part of your measurements, and some of the measurements are very high level, you know, the whole process, that's what I asked for. However, when we look at, from a value stream mapping perspective, we add detail as it relates to the amount of rework, uh, the amount of waste, uh, how long it takes to actually process it at each step along the way, which is not typical in the swim lane or typical process flow map process. And when we do that, we have the numbers and the discipline to actually drive change in the process and reduce burden on people, which is what the goal of this is uh, overall. Why? Helps people see and understand. Um, helps them forge agreements. So people say, well, we can do this value stream mapping with half the people remote, right? And I say, no. And people say, well, it's impossible for us to get all the people in the room for a week. And I say, well, then uh, this probably isn't for you. Good luck. Keep doing what you're always doing. The reason for that is we need to forge agreements face-to-face. 68% -face. of communication is nonverbal. We need to forge agreements with people face-to-face -face in a room and if they can't commit to doing that for, you know, four days or so uh, in a room, they're probably not going to make change in the organization anyway. But if you can make that commitment, we can advance significantly in that short period of time in a face-to-face -face matter. Can't be done remotely. Uh, value stream uncovers waste and problems in the flow of the value stream. Uh, helps people reach agreements on what to do to improve the process helps them uh, reach agreements so that we can make those improvements and we can actually sustain them because there are additional tools that we take on on top of that uh, that uh, link to the value stream map that, that reinforce the standard and uh, make it sustainable. I think I talked about a lot of these things already using the systems perspective so that it's inclusive across customer environments. Uh, links in work and the information flow. So we want to know what systems people are utilizing and uh, oftentimes those get improved in the process as well. A lot of times simplified. Um, it's problems. We calculate uh, processing time. So we make some distinctions between the way time ends up being consumed in the process. So uh, I'm going to uh, work, I'm going to use your process map here, and so I apologize for people on the camera, but I'm just pointing right now to one that says determine travel need. It's the first box on, on your map. Um, there, is a <coughs> there is a period of time in the, each process step where we're actively doing the process step. There is also oftentimes delays and snags that we run into in that process that it end up extending the amount of time it takes to do that. We separate those two things. We separate delay from actual processing time. And we have the team members do that as part of the value stream mapping process. When you go from one step to the next, and you'll see more examples of this, um, there is oftentimes the delay between, so if I send the request to the supervisor, and I'm waiting for my supervisor to approve it or not approve it, there's sometimes a delay there as well. Sometimes it's uh, almost immediate, so it could be as low as an hour, but it could be as long as two weeks. So the range could be from uh, 10 minutes to two weeks in delay, right? We capture that as well too. So one of the things that we look at when we're thinking about processes, usually a shorter process is more efficient, uh, and it, it uh, doesn't allow as many rework loops, and it doesn't allow the work content to get old or stale or 
uh, irrelevant in the process, so we want the shortest amount of time. So we look at delay, and we try to take delay out either within the work that we're doing or in between the process steps. So that's generally waste. Nobody values waiting. I don't know about you, but when I get to the airport and I see the TSA line, and it's got 150 people in it, and I go, excellent. I'm going to get to stand in line for 20 minutes, right? Nobody values waiting. That's my sarcasm for the day. I probably have more. Nobody values waiting, right? So even in this process, if you could make it flow efficiently without waiting, that would add value. So we try to take that out. And additionally, there's probably uh, extra processing time, things I don't need to fill out or I have to fill out twice or take longer to fill out than I could make more efficient. That's our processing time. We want to reduce that as well. The other thing we want to do is we want to look at how effective the process is in uh, delivering a valuable output. So you're going to hear a little bit about uh, what sounds like engineering here. You're going to, we try to calculate first pass yield. In other words, without intervention, how, long, how uh, effective is this in producing a good result in the first run without any rework? And so there's usually a lot of rework in our processes, and so we're calculating percent complete and accurate along the way. So first measure, process time. Second measure, delay time. Could be during a process step, or it could be in between the process step sitting in somebody's inbox. We calculate both of these things as we go through the process. You add process time, you add um, process time and delay time together, you get what we call lead time. Okay, That's how long it takes from when the process starts until the valuable result is spit out to the customer at the end. And we measure that because we want to know what that overall lead time is and we probably want to shorten it in some way. So these are the tools of the trade. And then the other part that I was just mentioning is the quality of the process. This is not the quality of the output. Okay? Generally in our office and administrative work that we do, People keep working the product over and over and over again until the quality is 100%. Okay, so I'm not talking about the quality of the outcome. So when we deliver the DROM report to uh, CMS, it's usually 99.9% .9 quality. The question is, how much work did we have to do to get it there? So you guys don't produce bad quality. Even the doctors that are doing surgery generally don't produce bad quality, but there may be a lot of rework in different departments in order to make that happen. We want to take that out. So we look at percent complete and accurate of the information coming into a process step. Okay? So when, let me use the example of travel here today. If you're going to um, make a request to your supervisor to get your travel approved, and you don't supply all the information to them, they get the request. You guys have probably received requests this way that aren't complete, and you go, ah, now i got to ask for this, or I have to fill in something myself because I know somebody's going somewhere and I'm going to fill it in. So the percentage of complete and accurate going preceding and going into the process step is measured at each process step. That is a, gives us a barometer of how much rework there is in each process step. You say, you know, doggone it, if so-and-so would only fill this out completely, then this process would flow much better. But we don't say that. We don't accuse so-and-so, because it's usually the process is failing somewhere along the way. We blame the process. But we're not about blaming people here. We're about blaming the process steps and creating a better standard and finding out what's happening in that process step that can make it more effective uh, when we do the redesign. So we measure percentage complete and accurate going into each process step, and it gives us a barometer of where we can potentially do some improvement or some fixing in the work. Remember, the value stream map is there to make visually represent what's happening with the existing process and give us an effective tool to add value, remove waste out of the process. Okay? Those are our major measures that we have. We summarize them something like this. Okay? 
you have a preceding step, okay? So you have a step that is something is being done. So I filled out my travel request authorization form. I sent it to the next step, which is the, the supervisor has to prove it. We calculate the delay time during that process step, the processing time, the value added work that's done. We know what technical system we might be utilizing with that. We've calculated the delay time before, and we also calculate the percentage complete and accurate. And we put those, or I put them as steps. You'll see how we do it here. We put uh, that information down below for each step in the process. Percentage complete and accurate. So we know what the delay time is before and after. We know what the delay time is within the process. And uh, how long it takes to actually do it while you're touching it. So what is the touch time or process time? And then what is the percentage complete accurate of the incoming information? So we can look back and see what we need to improve there. We have a lot, a lot of different map, mapping icons. I wouldn't worry about this too much. Uh, we help people with that. But you know, here's an example of an insurance one. Uh, it's not unlike some of the work that you do here from an office. Receive and arrange documents. Review policy information, verify it, calculate the payment, print and check it. Uh, what is the processing time? Two minutes. Well, once we receive it, we receive it right away. We do it in two minutes. There's really no delay time. We start and stop, we do it right away. Uh, percentage complete and accurate is 99% for this example. So we're calculating out all the way. Now the delay time in between before it gets to be reviewed, process time, delay time. Once we verify the claim, the processing time is 30 to 90 minutes, but it takes, there's delay time of one to seven days in there. What happens over the period of time, we may put it down, we may pick it up, we may put it down. The percentage of complete and accurate, 85%. So there's 15% uh, something missing here. Uh, in a lot of the examples we're utilizing here, uh, uh, not examples, but the work we're doing, the percentage is complete and accurate are much lower than that. There's a lot, which is just as indicative of a lot of rework being done at each step along the way, which is where we can get a lot of productivity. We calculate this, we map this whole process as a current state, and then we summarize the information so that we know uh, we have an idea, a very representative idea of a baseline. So what people say to me, and your team members have said to me also is, yeah, but Chris, we all do this a little differently. I'm like, yes, you do. Of course you do, right? Because you don't really have a standard in place today. And they say, well, we can't have a standard because some of it's very creative work. I hear this a lot from people in the IT department. And my answer to that is uh, there are still parts of the work that can be standardized. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it a high value uh, for everyone to move their code from uh, code complete from one environment to the next in a different way? Probably not, right? I mean, it might be, often causes disruptions, right? So there's administrative pieces of the work that could be standardized, and that's what we're after. Uh, we use the 80-20 rule. So 80% of the time, how is this review done? You know, because we go to the insurance company, and actually I work with insurance companies, they say, well, I receive and arrange it a different way than this person, than this person, than this person. And, you know, I don't want to take away the feeling that people have of the pride and uniqueness in their contributions, but uh, creating more variation in the process is not value add to the organization when it's unnecessary. So those are the parts we want to take out. Okay? That, that's how we approach it. So we work to create standards using the 80-20 rule for the baseline for the existing process. Once we've done that, as a group, so by the way, don't oh, oh, we go about it. Uh, we know customer and supplier issues, because sometimes there are suppliers of information in the process. Uh, the main process steps, we walk it noting information, technology use, process performance measure. We calculate all that at the end. When I have people mapping, the first thing we do is put all the major steps on. Because first I want to see if I can get agreement about that using the 80-20 rule before I add any additional detail. Then we make sweeps back through it. 
what is the technology that you want? And then we sweep back through and then we can capture the processing time. Then we make a sweep back through and we capture delay time. Then we make a sweep back through and capture percentage complete accurate. It's a nice way to flow the work and keep everyone on track with the least amount of rework and backing up in our mapping process as well, which is something we've thought a lot about, as you might expect. This is standard work for us to create standard work for the highest level of improvement. Uh, so then we draw the current state. We get that done. Uh, we build these zones, uh, sisters, systems and information flow. We haven't added all of this yet for ICRO. It's not relevant. We've added some system information in the process box. We have the process box. We have the process data. And then we just have summary and statistics at the bottom. We'll look at a live example here. Um, we talked to people about what, how to recognize the process step. It's more about even what you have. Determine our travel need. Speak to supervisor. Approved by sponsor. You've got the right level of steps here as well. So we work with them to make sure that they understand because when we first talk about process steps, everybody has their own vision in their own mind of what those process steps are. This is some work we did earlier today. Mm -hmm. And then, we calculate summary metrics uh, on at the very end. Once we get the process mapped out, we start to calculate the summary metrics of the process. So, how many steps? What is the process time? What is the delay time? Percentage complete after? And we make a delta. Keeping in mind that we have a current state map that we have the people do, so that we can establish a baseline around where it's uh, the work that everyone does using the 80-20 rule. Some organizations say, I don't care about that. Our process, current state process, I could care less about. Just draw me what the future should be. Why wouldn't we do that? We don't do that at all because we don't believe that we have a agreement about how the baseline is and we try to create a hypothesis for the future. We can't move from one to the next without knowing where we already started. In addition to that, we need to effectively document how the process is working today and how we want it to work in the future. So we have a delta between those two that we can measure whether or not we're making improvement. If we just take a hypothetical future state and say, let's try and achieve it, and I admit in part of my career, this is the way I was trained, and I did this often early on, utter failure. Never really works. Only kind of partially works and it doesn't work. So it's important for us to establish a baseline around the current state and then make a disciplined move from current state to future state. We have them map a current state. They establish and map a current state with the existing baseline information. At which point we take them through a problem solving activity. So what do we like or not like about the current state? And we identify all of the different, we call them Kaizen bursts. They're problems that we put all over the map. Uh, so now everyone can see and have agreement about what works and what doesn't. And then we have them calculate if they were to fix. So, well, let me back up just a second. Once we identify and brainstorm all the problems, we have them we take them through a focused process to identify which are the most important ones. We usually find five or so high, very high value ones to fix, five or so very important ones that will give us the most amount of return on our improvement in the shortest period of time. Why wouldn't we start with those, right? And we have the team members then take those five, we break them up into groups, and they uh, identify what the improvement would be in process time, delay time, percentage, complete and accurate. So we're going through, we're applying science to the process, just like you would apply science to anything else. And once they've calculated that, then we have them draft a future state map. So we have a current state, we have a th problems to fix, and we have a future state. And then we're staged and poised to begin the project work of improving the process. This is what we do in that first three and a half days 
uh, with the team members, three and a half to four days with the team members around that Kaizen week. Okay? So if you look here, typically we have something like this at the end. We have a current state with this level of metric, and we have that map. We have a future state that says where we want to be, and then we have the plus or minus delta about what we're going to improve. And as we start the standardization and the improvement process to get to the future state value stream map, this gives us the ability to go back and check against this and say, how are we doing against our hypothesis? Are we getting results that we wanted to or not? Are we doing the right thing or not? We should check and adjust uh, as much as we need to to try and get the highest value of improvement for creating value and for the people that are participating in the value stream. Today, we discovered and talked a lot about how value stream mapping can help improve process change and process improvement in the organization. Uh, we talked a lot about the involvement of people and the socio-technical aspects of making process change and utilizing this tool in order to do that. I hope you learned a lot. Don't be afraid to experiment on your own. And uh, good luck and have fun mapping. Thank you.